All right, we're live. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's February 18th, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Um, this morning, we're going to pick up on a, an issue related to audio only, and I've invited Helen Laban to come in and, and talk about um, the proposal that the House has put together. So Helen, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, and then uh, when you have written testimony, it'd be great for us to get it up on our webpage. So we go right ahead, introduce yourself for the record and we would like to hear your testimony. Great, thank you. And I'm uh, Helen Laban for the record. I'm the director of Vermont Public Policy for Bi State Primary Care Association. We represent FQHCs or Federally Qualified Health Centers. Uh, Planned Parenthood clinics of Northern New England, free and referral clinics, in addition to the area health education centers. Although as Senator Cummings, uh, Senator Lyons noted, this is the, uh, uh, I'm speaking more broadly uh, in terms of how this audio only telehealth came together. And there was a whole provider coalition behind me. So I just want to recognize that this is not just me speaking uh, for our members, but speaking for a broader coalition. Uh, and I, I, what I thought I would do is I wanted to offer a, a couple of framing comments. I'm mostly here to answer questions and give some details. As I had uh, indicated uh, earlier before we got started, I will be um, providing written testimony afterwards. I anticipated not being omniscient in this uh, hearing and that there might be some things I would need to look up afterwards and clarify. So I thought it might be easiest if I just uh, submitted afterwards with, with all of the details in place based on whatever questions you might have. Uh, but the two framing things that I wanted to mention here about what you're seeing from the House Healthcare uh, Committee in terms of the audio only telehealth. Uh, so as, as you know, the Department of Financial Regulation worked uh, very hard uh, for about six months over the summer and fall to look at this question of permanency for audio only telehealth. And at the end of that report, we did have agreement on general principles of what that might look like for permanent um, reimbursement. What you're seeing in the language right now from House Healthcare isn't that. Um, we, we looked at what these principles would be and we can get into those details later if you want to and it was a value-based system and we had these details and great expert testimony. After we got that general outline agreed to, the question then became, well, how long would it take to establish this reimbursement system? What additional data do we need? Um, we don't wanna base anything on what happened in utilization during a pandemic. We want it to be reflective of what we'll be using going forward. And how long will that take? And also, what do we need to do to not move backwards in the meantime, right? We wanna preserve the access that we've built now while we come up with this um, final solution. So the legislation from House Healthcare answers that bucket of questions. What does this temporary bridge need to look like and how long does it need to be in place to get us to where we are coming up with a permanent solution for audio only? So just, and I realize there's a lot of questions embedded in that, but just to acknowledge that that's the context here. Um, and we can talk about why it's structured this way instead of, for example, just extending the um, DFR authority. And then the, the other thing I just wanted to clarify was on how this billing works. And this is another big topic area and you're going to have to bear with me because I'm summarizing a lot of provider testimony as well as just the principles of this billing and coding. But just to be clear, when a, a provider is billing for a service, it does not start with modality, right? So we're not saying because you can bill for the telephone every time someone picks up a telephone that's then billable, right? It begins with what the service is. Um, it looks at um, what's being described by the CPT codes. There's thresholds for time, for medical decision-making, for providers. So for example, if you're talking to a nurse, a nurse can't necessarily bill for those services. So it's, it's tied to who's providing the services. And also I think critically for this, whether it's connected to a previous appointment or a upcoming appointment. So if it's part of an incident of care, and that's one incident, that's not a, a series of phone calls, it's, it's one incident of care. Um, and then you look at whether that modality is allowed. And additionally, you're going to look at the patient consent. So the House Healthcare Committee spent a long time on patient consent, and you see a lot of that content in this bill. It's largely based on existing telehealth precedent. So a provider will be speaking with a patient about what does audio only telehealth mean? Do you want to receive these services? Clarifying confusion about what constitutes a billable 
service through audio only telehealth and then the patient needs to previously consent both to receive the service and be billed for it. So that's intended to relieve confusion. It is true that those rules were waived during the public health emergency. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking about the supports that are gonna be there to make sure that that consent process and the informed consent of the patient is brought back um, as quickly as possible. And in many cases it already is because we're past the initial rush of the emergency. Um, and so, so those are just the two general framing things I wanted to, to clarify around what you're looking at here for audio only um, telehealth. And then Chair Lyons, um, I'm happy to take questions or continue to elaborate if you want. As, as you well know, I can talk forever about telehealth reimbursement. So I'm, I'm happy to address any questions or topic areas. Um, committee, before I ask questions, I'll open it up. Um, I, I, do, I do have one question. Um, the, the, this process, this sort of interim temporary bridge that allows for data collection is what I'm hearing you say, based on the principles that were agreed to with the um, working group and with DFR into the fall, but that bridge will last for enough time. How, so how was the time determined necessary for data collection? Is it based on a projection of when the uh, emergency ends? Um, Maybe speak to that. And then I do have one other question that I'll open it up. Yeah, so there, there, this is a very complicated thing. And as Senator Hardy noted previously, we did have the wrong date the first time around. So we know that it is very complicated to figure this out. So what we're looking at, so the principles for what we want to fund eventually is a value-based model um, that's decoupled from the fee-for-service chassis, which is a complicated thing to do in general, but, but you, you need to know the utilization patterns. The way we would get those is based on claims data. The claims data was set up in a way during the emergency, we, we, weren't, we weren't looking at like really detailed data collection on March 12th of last year, right? right. So, so we could put modify, we could have put modifiers onto the claims to provide details of what it was that you were billing for, was it by telephone? Um, you know, we could have worked with our providers on details of different codes to use, and we didn't have time to do that. So we want to do that now. And that's when you look at, I think it's section three in the current version or the version that I was looking at um, of the House Health Committee. So that's what that's setting up, is setting up that system for collecting this data to be able to build the reimbursement system. And then that needs to go into the next plan year. So that will be in 2022 because it's a calendar year. Um, and you also want to be out of the disruptive period of the pandemic when people are using um, healthcare very differently because they are trying to stay at home and stay out of the doctor's office. So 2022 becomes then the basis year that we're building from. You would want two years of data that brings us out through 2024 and that's how we get to our, our final um, decision. Um, and we also need to build in there some capacity for does statute need to change? Hopefully not. Um, but that's how we built out those couple of years. So beginning in 2022, as that data is collected and um, there will be, you'll be adhering to uh, current codes for. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Talk so about codes a little bit. I think. Yeah, I'll talk about codes a little bit. Um, so, so there's a couple of different code systems. You know, I had that, that pie chart last time. So there's the parity codes, which are the CPT codes, the, current procedural terminology codes um, that say, that are just a, a common way of talking about what surfaces it is that you're, you're delivering. And, and so, so where it's at parity with an in-office visit, so it's the equivalent of this, if it had been that in-office visit, you know, an hour with your therapist, right? That has a CPT code attached to it. You then, you then indicate a location, which would be, it was virtual. And you could add, and we're proposing you add then a modifier saying it was virtual and also it was done by audio, not by audio visual. Um, there are also another set of codes that are not equivalent to an office visit. So an example of this would be say the triage co codes, those you know, five to 10 minutes of clinical conversation to determine what visit is appropriate. Those have a separate sort of set of coding and we would want to look at 
those as well. Those are inherently by the telephone. So we know what those are. But then when you're looking at that bundled payment, you want both in there, right? That's the whole point of doing a, a um, value-based payment is that you can be flexible and go between these different types of interactions, both the in-office equivalent and the things that are designed for a telephone quick check-ins to come up with the final package. So those are the, the sort of broad different sets of, of codes that we would be looking at. Um, the, the, the legislation does propose a working group with DFR and the Green Mountain Care Board and people who are very good at coding uh, to come up with the specifics of that. And also, you know, we have to do some amount of training um, with providers, uh, with practices to be sure that they're implemented correctly. Okay. Um, questions committee and uh, Senator Hardy. Okay, thank you, Helen. Thank you for being here. This is helpful. Um, so just to make sure I understand when you're talking about the coding and the types of visits, I'm gonna give you some examples. And um, <laughs> so I go in and I get a mammogram and my doctor calls me to tell to discuss the results with me. I'm billed for the mammogram appointment, but her calling me and discussing the results is not billed as a separate telephone uh, uh, a visit with my doctor. Is that correct? So I can speak to the principles of it. I will say that Representative Black is the billing and coding expert. So, uh, so, so, so she can answer any question anyone might have about any of this. So, so the question would be, we're setting up a parity system, so it's the equivalency, right? So would you under normal circumstances, some things are bundled, and some things are not, and I don't know if a mammogram is or not because I'm not a doctor okay. and I'm not a biller. Um, okay. so, so if it would in normal circumstances be a bundled visit, then it stays that way because we're setting up parity. If under normal circumstances, the practice would have called you into the office and billed you separately for coming into the office, then it's billed separately. It doesn't change from the way it's currently happening right now. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the point of building it on the parity framework that we don't have to make these decisions that just happens the way it normally would have happened. Okay, so that <laughs> norm, because that's the thing I'm trying to make sure we're not just sort of adding on uh, uh, expense to what has been happening for years. You know, me calling the nurse to discuss my child's ear infection or whatever. I don't want to start adding costs to families and, and individuals for medical medical you know, contact that's been going on for years and not been billed to prov uh, to individuals. I do want to make sure we have access. So there's this balance of, which I think we're all trying to achieve of access and affordability. And, you know, my concern about, um, and part of it is just me not knowing enough probably, um, is that we're, you know, adding additional cost onto people while we're at increasing their access. And so I'd I wanna try to increase access but not increase cost if that's at all possible. Um, so just how, how has that discussion been in these? So, so this would be, the intent is not to add costs. So the intent, so right, as I said, the intent is because it's parity, it, it should be, equal to the way it happened before, except for in that instance where you're adding access. The, the exception to that and where you would see more, and this would not be necessarily a cost to the, the patient is we are attempting to build slightly different systems in those non-office visit equivalent codes. So like those triage codes, which do not have a copay. So the, the patient does not end up having a copay, but overall from the system, it's better if you incentivize, and you see this in like the Kaiser Permanentes of the world or the Geisingers coming out of the pandemic. They're setting up things like a formalized triage system because you want to induce patients going to the right next step. So if you can increase the, the amount to which patients are calling into the office to get a clinical determination when they aren't sure if they should be coming in or if they aren't sure if they should be going to a specialist or they just aren't sure what the next step is, you want more of those to happen because it reduces inefficiencies within the system. So that's an example of where we would see 
a new bundle of costs to the overall healthcare system, but to the goal of reducing overall costs because you're using the services more efficiently. So it's so so there's the parity from what's normally happening, but then there's also, you know, we have a goal of having a more efficient, more cost-effective system at the end of this. So we are incentivizing some new uses there with, with the telephone. But uh, so just to interject here, um, that change, as you have described it to me, and if I'm uh, understanding it accurately, is a temporary bridge. So the changes that you're talking about are not going to be in place until and unless we act further. Is that accurate? Not that is more or less accurate. So there is a, um, a whole world of uh, telephone-based services like chronic care management, like remote patient monitoring that we see in place or going into place, for example, with ACO systems that are at full capitation um, and value-based or with those Kaiser Permanentes in the world that are, are well integrated. And, and we see those going into place as a way to improve quality of care, reduce cost of care and be more efficient in workforce. Those are sort of like the three things you look for when you implement telehealth systems. Okay. That is strategic and it's difficult. That is not what this sets up. That's what's bridging us towards. And that's why it gets more complicated and we needed more than six months in the middle of a pandemic to do it. Um, so there is I a <laughs> future world that we're trying to get to in right. by the end of 2024. <laughs> okay, I see Senator Cummings and then I think Senator Hooker, I'm not sure. Yeah, Senator Cummings, go ahead. Yeah, um, actually I'm a little confused because I asked to have someone talk about the governor's, national well, well, governor's. Senator, we, this was, uh, I had scared. Yeah, but I, I got told Helen was going to talk we'll about it, but testimony. she didn't. Um, <laughs> What I'd like to know, Helen, is we have Medicare, Medicaid, and two basic health insurance companies in this state. <clears throat> Medicare and Medicaid, the feds will decide if they're going to participate. Do the two insurance companies that provide the bulk of the health care in our market, not the ERISAs, do they support this proposal? They do not, no. Okay. Uh, let me rephrase. They do not support parity as the bridge. My understanding is that they support getting to a value-based payment. The, the area of disagreement is how quickly can we get there and what is the appropriate bridge to get there? So okay. it's a, it's a time-limited amount of disagreement. So they disagree with the, with the two-year bridge and data collection process. That is my understanding, although of course they'll have to well, speak that's, themselves. Yeah, it's not, you don't represent them, so you can't right. answer. Right, are we gonna hear from them? Oh, we can hear from anybody you would like, Senator. I think that we will hear from them. I'm, what I'm gonna suggest actually, after we finish asking Helen's uh, questions for Helen, is uh, that we all go back and look at the testimony that uh, was given to the House uh, Healthcare and review some of the work that they've done on this. So, um, and then we'll also hear from folks um, on this. Um, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you. Um, Helen, I, I guess I'm still confused and going back to the sort of triage thing and the, the examples perhaps. Um, I call my doctor or my pediatrician in the middle of the night to say my child has a fever he tells me and it's dark i mean that's what he said years ago but it, something like that is that going to be seen as a a call as an you know an appointment that would not be yeah, again i can only speak to the framework right i'm not a biller that would not be considered a telehealth appointment for one thing you would have to pre-establish that this is how you're going to be doing it and set up that system and agree to it for it to be one of these parity telemedicine appointments. So no, it's it's not. The, uh, the telemedicine visit is a pre-planned thing. Um, it might be considered a triage call, but you don't get charged for those. So as far as you're concerned, you are simply calling your doctor. Your doctor might get $12 to compensate for taking call in the middle of the night, but that's... It's, it's not considered an appointment, no. Okay, and with regard to the pre-consent and, and the 
you know, um, when does this take place? I mean, when do, do you tell your all of your patients, you know, now we're in this new world of, of telemedicine and audio only, they, this may be an appointment that is you know, done by phone? So it, it depends on how your practice implements it. So it has to happen prior to. It can happen, say you're call, say a patient is calling a practice to schedule an appointment. They say, you know what? I can't make it in person. I would like to do this remotely. Then they can do the consent there and schedule it as a telemedicine visit. Or you know, a common use for this in particular in audio only, the most common use is, say you're seeing a mental health provider they, you see them every week and you say, you know what, this is a real burden, driving an hour, getting childcare. I would really like another alternative. Can we work something out? And then the provider would say, well, sure, we've got these telehealth options. I may not feel comfortable with this being every week, but every other week or once a month, we can set, offset one of those appointments. They come, you come up with a plan and you consent that this is the plan that we've agreed to for these services. And that's by far the most common application of audio only telehealth. Thank you. Um, Josh, any questions? Okay. Um, so uh, as, as I was looking at some of the testimony in the, um, in the house healthcare, uh, they heard from patients who were isolated geographically and uh, one patient who was a, a cancer uh, on cancer survivor, but also being looked after by her oncologist, and was um, the suggestion is, and she was very amenable to having audio only uh, calls as part of her care. But the, that has to be something that's agreed to with informed consent by the patient. Is that right? Correct, Senator Lyons, that is correct. Um, did, and did you want to add, finish any answer to that question before, you know, Senator Cummings? Well, I, my understanding is there doesn't have to be a prior relationship with the doctor, that doctors can see new patients via audio only. I, Senator, thank you for bringing that up. So there is a provider patient relationship clause in there. There are a couple of different limiting factors on that. That is there in there primarily for mental health concerns. So there, there are conditions where, um, and we, we have heard it um, from our doctors and also our dentists, interestingly, where there is a, a barrier related to mental health needs to coming in in person, dental, there are true phobias. Um, so you would bring a patient in, uh, mental health providers, people who, who have trouble leaving the, the house for various reasons, you want to get them into care. So the goal is to facilitate those relationships. Um, you would need to legally have a patient provider relationship established because that's one of the things that protects a patient. That's when you begin to invoke standard of care, clinical practice, malpractice, heaven for fend. Um, it is established then. So for patient protection, we need to allow that provider patient relationship to get established for those who need to start care through an audio only connection. For other providers like medical providers, for example, if you have, if you're bringing a, a, a new patient onto your panel and you're a family physician, usually the code that you're doing that through is a well visit where you have a physical required. So for them, there are other things that limit how you can bring on a new patient that clinically you need to do a physical exam. But for urgent cases, for mental health concerns, there is a, a, a set of vulnerable patients who do require that audio only connection to be their first connection. And we wanted to be sure that they had the um, uh, protections of a full provider patient relationship should they need to initiate that way. Senator, Senator Cummings, does that answer your question? I'm, I'm sorting it through. Okay. I, under, I understand mental health. And you're saying that I couldn't just move in or 
pick up the phone, the uh, internet, whatever. And this isn't limited to primary care either. I couldn't call an osteopathic or an, no, osteopathic is a different kind of doctor, an orthopedic doctor and talk to him about the pain in my ancient knee. And, you know, tell him I need some pain medication. I can't walk, I can't come in. He could send me some very strong medication how does he know who I am? So I am, there's two, two elements there. I am not familiar with prescribing rules and regulations. So they, they have a separate set of rules and regulations around prescribing, particularly of, of different substances. And I know, for example, for MAT treat, uh, medically assisted treatment, there's a whole set of separate rules. You are still held to clinical best practices the billing doesn't determine what is appropriate practice as a clinician. You still have a code of ethics that you need to adhere to first and foremost. Billing comes way down the list of what you as a doctor should be practicing. So I can only answer, not being a clinician myself and not knowing how one examines a knee, I can only answer to the structure that we're creating here. But a doctor is still held to clinical standards and that's separate but, from how billing works or how they move out. But I could then hang up the phone and call another orthopedic doctor using a different name. I mean, doctor, no, doctors don't do the billing. Somebody in the front office does the billing. It's audio, so you can't see my driver's license. You can't see my insurance card. You can't, you know, it, 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 there's a lot. I, if I've got an ongoing relationship and I call up and my doctor knows I'm either prone to hypochondria or I'm not prone to hypochondria, that's one thing. But if... How does the doctor have any idea who or what I am when they can't see me, they can't see my IDs, they can't see my insurance? There's a risk there. And probably the risk is to the doctor. Well, so, Senator Cummings, me, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I wanna make sure we get to Senator Terenzini. Uh, the, the, the question that Senator Cummings is asking is what I'm hearing actually is could a patient initiate a doctor patient relationship out of the blue with an audio only visit that to a specialist um, with, and then uh, end up getting some schedule two medication. I mean, that's a pretty complex. <laughs> I, I, I know, I hope that some of the providers who are, uh, viewing the committee meeting will help us answer that question. I, I could answer it from personal experience um, and understanding the system, but I think we probably will need to hear from folks about this. It's, there's a whole lot of medical practice concerns embedded in that one question. Um, so uh, Helen, did you wanna? I, well, and I, I would simply add, the regulatory framework for this, at the end of the day, if you are an unethical medical provider, of which I hope we have none in Vermont, I do believe you're going to practice unethically regardless of modality. I mean, at the end of the day, the telephone can't guard against people trying to game the system. All right, I set an alarm to make sure I didn't run over at 9.30, <laughs> Chair Alliance. <laughs> I just that, turned that okay. off. We'll, we'll go over about five, uh, five or six minutes uh, and then move on, so. Trying to respect your schedule. <laughs> no, you are, and we appreciate it. Uh, Senator Terenzini, you have a question. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, you know, I sort of wanted to echo what Senator Cummings um, and concern is I 
sorry, our Alexa is notifying me there's someone at the door. Uh, we, um, what was I saying? The, um, I've supported, I'm, I support the audio only uh, piece. I think it's important. Uh, I think it's, it's only smart, but I do think that first wellness visit with a patient, a new patient and a doctor is critical because as we've heard testimony, there's something to that visual piece for a physician to lay his or her eyes on the patient. And maybe they'll observe something that the patient isn't uh, able to um, offer through audio only. I, I, I think there's a big concern here not, and I understand the one part of, you know, you could doctor shop uh, to try to get certain types of medication, but I, I would fear that something simple was missed by the phone just because that doctor hasn't had the opportunity to lay his or her eyes on the patient for at least that first visit. Um, look at, I, we have four children, eight, eight and under. I mean, we're on the phone on a weekly basis with our doctor or by uh, telemed. I think it's fantastic, but I do think this is the, the scary component to audio only um, that I, and it sounds like probably others need a little better um, explanation or conversation around. And, and I would suggest that this still, it does come back to the clause about being held the same standard of care and the same clinical standards. So uh, uh, th that's really what's the safeguard here. And that's really what is the driving factor is that the clinician is going to be upholding the same standard of care as if they were in person. And that will push the audio only to, to be the last choice for clinicians. On the other hand, if it is a, a truly urgent situation and the phone is your only connection to the healthcare provider, then we want that to be available for you. It, 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 we, would, we don't want anyone to settle for no care as their solution. And that's really what we're looking at here is to prevent the situation where you simply are not getting the care that you need. Okay, I think that's a good place to, to end the conversation for today. Obviously, uh, there's an interest in hearing more from the folks who have worked on this, uh, including the insurance providers. Um, so we'll, we'll try to find some time. Uh, I think we have some time next week where we can put uh, some testimony in. In the meantime, Helen, it would be really helpful to have some written testimony. You've heard the questions and concerns from the committee. I think, um, you know, I think they're pretty much shared by committee members. I think we all, uh, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I certainly support the audio only piece. We want to make sure that the protections are in place uh, so that we don't go off the rails uh, in the next couple of years. So that's it for today. Thank you very much on short notice for being here. I know you had expressed an interest and I found a half an hour, so thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And as indicated, I will go back, get details on the questions and submit it as, as written testimony for you. For yes, reason. that would be good. And any suggestions you have for folks who could clarify some of the concerns about audio first visit, uh, coding, um, best practice, uh, some of the questions that you've heard, if you have folks who can respond to those interests, uh, that would be also appreciated. I have my homework. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. All right, good. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you, committee. That was, I think that was helpful. At least we got a lot of questions out on the table that we need to explore further. And I know Senator Cummings, you were interested in what the National Governors Association is doing. And well, then, they, they did a white paper and I just think it might be good for us to hear what their research said. So uh, if that would be helpful, perhaps you could send the link for that to Nellie and we can put that up on our webpage. That would be good. I, think that it's already been sent. I was CC'd. I think Margaret Ligas sent it out. Okay, good. All right. So we'll make sure that's there and we'll, we'll get, I guess Margaret Ligas is the person who can speak to that. Um, we'll find I out. I think she's also representing um, the some national, of the health insurance companies. Right. The national insurance group. I didn't get that letter. So I don't think she sent it. No, to no, you, she did Okay. Didn't. She didn't. I'll make sure, I'll find it and send it to Ellie uh, Nellie, and she can get it out to you. And I have it somewhere, and we'll 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 coordinate. 
Senator Lyons, it would be really helpful to hear from, I, I'm sure you're planning this, but from physicians about the standards of care questions. Um, I think they'll be able to allay some concerns about the examples that we were providing today. Very good. When that I think should happen. Okay. Um, so we are moving on and today um, we have um, some representatives from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Coalition today. I, are you celebrating a day? Who's the spokesperson? Chris, are you the spokesperson? I, I am. Terrific. And so uh, why don't you, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I think, are you speaking on behalf of the group and coordinating the testimony or not? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, for the record, Chris Donnelly with the Champlain Housing Trust and I'm a co-chair of the Vermont Housing Conservation Coalition. I'm gonna be really brief um, because we have some other witnesses here. I just wanna set the stage for you. Um, so um, just very quickly, the Vermont Housing Conservation Coalition is a group of about 50 organizations working in your communities um, and others throughout the state. Uh, we use the VHCB do B dollars that the legislature allocates to create housing and conserve land with the goals of really improving the lives of Vermonters as well as the state's economic vitality. The coalition this year is asking the General Assembly to support the governor's recommendation of $34.8 million to VHCB so we can continue to do the vital work that um, we do of not just responding to the pandemic and I would an aside, just um, the work that you all did over the last year to support the most vulnerable Vermonters was amazing and thank you for that. Um, so we'd, we we're gonna continue to do that work but we also um, are here to help lead the economic recovery to make sure that um, no Vermonters are left behind. We also um, ask that the funds that are allocated to be to be, and there are some one-time funds in the budget recommendation. We ask that those are um, able to be used flexibly for either housing or conservation. And we have witnesses here from both sides of our coalition today to talk about the values um, on, on Vermonters health um, uh, when we make those investments. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, and turn it over to the, um, uh, the other witnesses, unless people have questions for me. I'm always happy to come back as well. Uh, why don't we just go right ahead? And, and if someone has a question, uh, just raise your hand and we can look for an answer. Okay. I think Kevin is up first. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Kevin Loso. I'm the, um, actually I'm here this morning representing Housing Initiatives Inc., which is a nonprofit affiliate of the Rutland Housing Authority for which I serve as um, executive director. Back on August 6th of last year, uh, VH, VHCB uh, granted to the uh, Housing Initiatives Inc. Uh, the funding necessary to transform uh, what was a uh, old John Deere dealership here in Rutland into nine units of um, affordable uh, rental housing. Uh, it included one efficiency, uh, five one bedrooms, uh, three uh, two bedrooms, uh, community room, office, and uh, play space, which uh, hopefully will be installed once the uh, winter weather is uh, is behind us. In advance of the um, of that award, we did a significant amount of uh, legwork here in the community uh, to determine exactly what the uh, the program uh, for that uh, facility should be and uh, the construction process. Uh, we worked uh, extensively with our community partners and determined that uh, a transitional housing site uh, would best meet the needs uh, here in our area. Uh, the transitional housing site is intended to bring uh, folks out of homelessness, uh, particularly out of motels during the uh, pandemic and uh, to, to provide them with the uh, services necessary to stabilize those individuals and families. Uh, that could include uh, addressing food insecurity, uh, access to benefits, uh, mental health, substance abuse, primary care access, uh, education, parenting skills, uh, job counseling and supports uh, with the goal of getting uh, of, of this being a sort of a temporary stop along the way to uh, permanently affordable housing and hopefully uh, increased um, family uh, self-sufficiency. 
Uh, it was a big goal, but we had uh, some great uh, community partners, Humble's Prevention Center uh, here in Rutland. Uh, they uh, they uh, oversee the coordinated entry list from which our uh, tenants are, are pulled, so to speak. They also provide case management services. We had Rutland Mental Health Services um, as part of the coalition, Brock Community Action, United Way of Rutland County, uh, Project Vision. And uh, I think most notably for this committee, uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center, in their recognition of the link between health and housing, or housing as a vaccine, so to speak, they agreed to master lease two units within the property uh, to have on an ongoing basis, the ability to discharge patients from the medical center who uh, are ready to be discharged, uh, but otherwise cannot be because they have no place to go. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, this will have a, uh, a significant positive impact on, uh, on length of stay, uh, recovery, and overall uh, chronic care management. Uh, additionally, the uh, medical center uh, embarked on a uh, capital campaign in support of the project. There, are if there were areas of uh, need that were not covered by the um, by the CARES Act funding, uh, and uh, they were wildly successful. The community uh, responded um, very uh, very graciously. The goal, actually, the deadline, the mandate, if you will, was to have this property completed on December 20th of 2020. Uh, just an extraordinary undertaking and something that could not have been made possible without the support and input of a, of a just a vast number of individuals and organizations. And if I tried to list them all, I would utilize all my remaining time, but um, Suffice to say that uh, we had a uh, we had an extraordinary uh, team of um, uh, we had an extraordinary contractor and team of subcontractors that uh, that really rose to the occasion to make this project possible. On December twentieth, uh, right on target, we were able to open the uh, the the facility. We leased up an initial uh, six units, six families, on December twenty second. Uh, obviously, just in time for the Christmas holidays, I can uh, uh, you, you cannot imagine, nor can I describe uh, the level of uh, emotion uh, that that took place on that day for so many of our um, so many of our new uh, residents that uh, had spent months and months in in motels. I think all of them came from a motel setting, including one young single mom who had spent 10 months in a motel room and came to us with a three month old infant. So <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can put the pieces together there, just an extraordinary uh, uh, situation. Uh, again, our community partners stepped to the plate. Uh, we had a, a holiday dinner, we had toys for the kids. We had just a very welcoming environment in which to um, move these new, uh, move these families, uh, move these families into. Uh, I'm going to ask Chris to um, show a couple of the photos, the uh, results of the work. This is Rutland Area Bridge Housing. It's located at 101 US Route 4 West here in Rutland. Uh, again, it's uh, nine units, including uh, one unit, which is uh, for a, a property manager. Move forward. This is a community room. Unfortunately, not a lot of use. <laughs> It's not seen a lot of use right now because of the pandemic. We are uh, restricting access to it, uh, but uh, located off of the, uh, of the community room is uh, laundry facilities, and those are uh, provided at no cost to the tenants. This is a typical apartment, at least the, uh, the kitchen setup for a typical apartment. Uh, the next photo is uh, you might find kind of boring, but um, <laughs> actually I find it quite exciting. The equipment mounted on the wall is the infrastructure for a um, uh, solar installation. Uh, we're able to do that part of the project through the grant funds. And uh, the second component is being funded by V-Lite. Um, they provided us with 80, close to $80,000 so that ultimately this property will be uh, net zero. It'll, it'll uh, generate all of its own uh, electrical needs and any excess will be actually sold to the housing authority and those funds will help support the ongoing operating budget uh, for the, uh, for the, the property. Uh, I said it was uh, transitional housing and, and amazingly enough, we've had our first graduate. 
Uh, after just two months, uh, we are uh, pleased to, to announce that um, one of our initial families will be moving on to permanent housing. And the reason she's able to do this is that because of her, her stay at uh, Bridge Housing and the ability to have a, a fixed address, a mailing address, her employer offered her a, a district manager position with the, uh, I believe it's uh, the Dollar, uh, Dollar General chain. Uh, so she's ready to move on and we're, we're excited for her, we're happy for her, and uh, we, we know that she's going to do really well. So in closing, I would just again reiterate um, my hope that you'll support the governor's uh, recommended funding of Vermont Housing Conservation Board at uh, 34.8 million and to provide them with the flexibility necessary to meet local uh, community need. One other thing about VHCB that I'm always very quick to mention is that this is not just about providing money to uh, nonprofit affordable housing developers. This is about providing an extraordinary level of technical assistance and expertise that makes our finished products of the high quality that it is. So uh, I wanna recognize that as well. So I'm gonna wrap up because I'm a little over. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions either now or at any time. I'm at the Rutland Housing Authority, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, so back to you. Um, Megan, you wanna jump in? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. My name is Megan Marcusy. I'm the Care Continuum Manager and the Blueprint for Health Program Manager here for North Country Hospital in Newport, Vermont. Um, I represent the Northeast Kingdom beneficiaries of Vermont Housing and Conservation Board funding. And I'm just here to show you what this has done for and it meant to our community. So I'm just gonna share my screen very quickly. Okay, so Bluffside Farm is a beautiful piece of land located along Lake Memphis just moments from North Country Hospital. This land sustains our community's physical and emotional health all year long. Locals and tourists flock to the site for its vast offerings of nature trails and its peaceful and picturesque um, lakefront views. My family in particular is one of many of the um, community members who utilize this property on a regular basis for a scenic outside escape. This past year, having this piece of land available for our community was particularly important with COVID-19 as it served as a safe outdoor refuge for locals to socially distance themselves while enjoying exercise and fresh air. Okay. Um, this land is also utilized by North Country Hospital in partnership with the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. This four-year partnership we hold near and dear and it allows us to support community members who are faced with food insecurity and, un and the underemployed youth population. A team of 68 youth um, members with guidance of two crew leaders cultivate organic produce right on this very property um, for those who are often faced with the challenge of not having enough to eat. We are instilling a sense of purpose, work ethic, and a sense of community in the youth working on the farm while helping families not go hungry. Ten percent of Vermonters are food insecure. They lack regular access to nutritious food. Children in particular are at greatest risk for poor health, developmental delays, poor academic achievements, depression aggressive or hyperactive behavior, behaviors due to a lack of um, access to these, you know, to proper nutrition and a healthy diet and lifestyle. In 2020, food insecurity rose 33% in Vermont during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm proud to say in 2020, we were able to use Bluffside Farm for a drive up healthcare shares program um, in partnership with the VYCC. And we served 80 families from this property for a total of 232 community members. 40 of these members were um, seniors and 72 were children, some of our most vulnerable population. The conservation of this beautiful farm is fundamental to our local community, not only for physical and emotional health, but for our economy. With seasonal jobs that it allows through the VYCC and the tour, um, and it's driving a tourist um, market that tourists are flocking to this site because it's such a beautiful piece of property. Um, in addition, an additional use of this property will come the North Country's Hospital first ever at Lap 45 Challenge. It's a paddle, run, bike, 
a mini triathlon, if you will, event to benefit the local fight against diabetes. Due, the, due to the pandemic, this event will not um, hasn't taken place yet, but it will June 18th, 2022. I ask you to please um, support the recommended budget of the $34.8 million and allow for the flexibility in how these funds are spent. As a Vermonter, I know that no two of our communities are alike. We all have very unique needs. The Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has our community's best interest in mind and is able to make um, great funding decisions on our behalf. With that being said, I just wanted to, you know, thank you all for your time and your consideration on this matter. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I have memories of when the land was turned over from the private owners to the state and now being conserved so effectively. Um, thank you for that. We may invite you back in again as you, as the um, blueprint and community <laughs> connections person. Thank you. You're very welcome. Nice to meet you all. That's, that's what we have for you today, unless you have any questions for us. Any questions? Uh, Senator Hardy and then Senator Hooker. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, this was the second presentation I heard from Chris and his, his team um, about housing. Um, and it's super impressive, um, both the stories we just heard. Um, Megan, I just had a question for you. Um, the, the land, I, I'm not familiar with that project. Um, was that funded through VHCB? That was, I, I'm assuming so, since you're asking that we support VHCB, but is that how the land was preserved through funding with VHCB? Um, I, I believe it's being conserved through this funding, yes, absolutely. Okay. I, th and I think that's a great I jump oh. in here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, it's also um, currently owned by the Vermont Land Trust and Vermont Land Trust, and they are uh, managing the conservation piece of it. Okay, through funding from VHCB or in part, in sort of a partnership. Correct, okay. and and along with their fundraising efforts. Great, it's a beautiful piece of property and. Thank you for sharing that. So maybe we should have a road trip one of these days and look at some of these uh, projects. Oh, everybody's saying yes. So yeah, any time. Yeah. As soon as we're out of COVID, <laughs> that that let's put that, uh, Chris. Let's let's do a little we're, thinking we're about to. you know some places we can go. Um, across the state that would help us understand the work that's going yeah, on. Happy to do that. I know Cheryl, um, uh, Senator Hooker was able to do some of that last last fall, fall before. Fall before. Right. I'll do it. Okay. It was great. Thank you all for being here. This has been uh, very, very helpful and transitional housing is such a key need right now. Uh, Senator Terenzini had a question. Oh, just a quick comment, Senator uh, Lyons. I was going to say that I live less than a mile away from the bridge housing in Rutland, and Senator Hooker's probably at a mile away from the bridge housing. And that project, uh, how it came together from start to finish, was was quite a feat and and incredible to watch and uh, much needed for the community. So I know that Senator Hooker, I'll speak for Senator Hooker, and I are very excited that it's working and, and that it's here, and and um, we appreciate what Kevin and his team are doing. Uh, to, to help those in need in Rutland County. And thank, if I may. Go ahead. Senator, thank you. And just to add to that, uh, certainly a wonderful turnaround, uh, amazingly um, coordinated by Kevin and his team. And thank you so much to, the, to VHCB. Um, one thing about that is that <clears throat> they had hoped to have services on site and that still hasn't happened. And that's something that I hope that we can work on in the future for these types of projects. And also just a question for Chris. Chris, the mm -hmm. 34.8 million, is that fully fully funding the VCHB? Um, so the, the uh, VHCB is typically funded through the property transfer tax. If the full statutory share came to VHCB, it would be uh, 29. 5 million, I believe, 29.3 million. 
So it's a little bit above that, but that just recognizes the, the one-time available funds that um, uh, have just resulted, you know, resulted from the budget surplus this year. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, this has been terrific and we appreciate the work that you're doing very much in each of our communities. Uh, yes, thank we'll, you very much. You know, we, we're not the appropriations committee, unfortunately, you know, cause we go get so enthusiastic, but it doesn't mean we can't offer support going forward. So thank you. All right, um, we're moving on to uh, the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. And today is a, uh, I, is it the week or the day that we are celebrating, uh, Peter? <laughs> Yesterday was recovery day. Yesterday and this was is, recovery day. This is recovery week because we're reaching out throughout the week to uh, check in with people. So you let me know when I'm going to introduce Daniel and I'm just going to say a few words if that's all right. That's terrific. Um, and why don't we, why don't we just go right ahead our, so we stay within our time and look forward to your testimony. I Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm Peter Mallory. I'm in charge of government relations and advocacy for the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery and Recovery Vermont. And I just want to introduce Daniel Franklin. But before I do that, um, I just want to talk for a minute about uh, what's going on around the state. We have 12 recovery centers. They're a national model. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of the work they're doing. It's a struggle, it's a struggle, and we're gonna have, and Daniel may say this, but as we are gonna see in mental health coming out of the pandemic, uh, you know, as well as I do on this committee, uh, what's happening under underground, as it were, at the moment. And as we come out of the pandemic, the uh, systems for mental health and community mental health and for the recovery centers and the recovery system of care are going to be stressed. They're going to be stressed to the maximum. So that said, I wanna also say thank you for hearing us today. I see a number of old friends on this committee and some people I don't know yet, but I wish we were all in the hallways so we could get to know each other a little better. But uh, there are even a couple of people, three people here I served with some time ago. So that's a pleasure always. And it was great to hear about Rutland, incidentally, because uh, I did a year's work for Governor Shumlin in Rutland on a couple of projects. So it's, it's nice to see that all moving forward. And transitional housing is one of the issues that Daniel's going to address in terms of recovery. Now, Daniel Franklin is a real star in recovery. He uh, is the executive director of the North Central Vermont Recovery Center. He's also president of the Association of Recovery Center Directors. He has built uh, a remarkable recovery community in Morrisville and has worked very closely on the things that are happening in Johnson with the Tetros, et cetera, who I'm sure some of you know about. And uh, he's, uh, he's a, as I say, he's a superstar, Daniel, you are. And uh, uh, so I wanted to bring him to you today because he has a lot more wisdom than I do. So it's nice to see you all. Uh, thank you, Peter. And you know, I, we probably should introduce Senator Terenzini, who you may not know, who is also from Rutland, along with Senator Hooker, and right. then Senator Hardy from Addison County and right. Senator Cummings, Washington County. So, I, Good. I know, well, I, there are two folks here. Oh, you went out, your, your sound went out. Well, I, so- I just had a call through, oh, sorry. Okay, no problem. So why don't we uh, go ahead with Daniel Franklin. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyons, Madam Chair. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be back here. 
Um, and I'd like to start with uh, a somewhat, uh, you know, a written statement um, that just articulates some of the points I'd like to share with you today. Uh, and then I'm really eager to hear your questions, comments, and, and thoughts, and, and to share some other information with you. Um, so uh, I've got a written, written statement here. Um, I'm grateful to be with you today and to have the opportunity to share about the value of recovery centers and peer recovery support services and to lend a voice to the hope of the recovery community that our elected leaders, including the legislature, will choose to make care for people with substance use disorders a priority this session. A year ago, I shared with members of this committee about the recovery coaches in the emergency department program which to date has served more than 900 unique individuals, over 80% of whom have engaged in often life-changing recovery and treatment services following their release from the hospitals. I use this program to illustrate how our services have saved the state healthcare system millions of dollars while helping people progress from some of their most difficult struggles to a productive life and recovery. But I did not ask for anything of you in that testimony, and today I will. Substance use disorders directly affect tens of thousands of Vermonters, tens of thousands of families, but in the end, we're all affected. Substance use is linked as both cause and effect to virtually every other issue we care about, every aspiration we have as a state, and everything we are trying to do to improve the places that we call home. The pandemic has brought on immense struggles at all levels of our society, but it has been particularly harmful for people in or seeking recovery and perhaps even more so for the, those who are not yet ready to pursue recovery. Relapses and overdoses are up dramatically. Alcohol sales have increased between 25 and 40% throughout Vermont. Many people have lost jobs and homes and much else. Inpatient treatment centers and detox facilities and hospitals have had severely diminished capacity for nearly a year, thus rendering hyperlocal resources the only option for people in need. The general assistance hotels are overrun with people in need of shelter, approximately three quarters of whom have a substance use disorder and or mental health challenge. And it might shock many of you to know the degree to which recovery center personnel are serving on the front lines in all of these places and more, even when we were not deemed essential services by AHS until December. Because of that, we missed out on all forms of economic assistance, such as hazard pay for our employees, with the exception of $5,000 toward PPE from the CARES Act for, for PPE and cleaning supplies. But we will be an essential part of the long, long recovery to come, not just for the people we serve, but for our communities. And the nature of that recovery will directly correlate to whether our government chooses to invest in our capacity and our well being as people and organizations. As dire and complex as the challenges we face are, challenges such as the opioid epidemic and the COVID 19 pandemic, if you want to find hope, if you want to find truly cost effective, innovative, evidence based solutions that save and improve lives, you don't have to look very hard. In one way or another, Vermont's rec regional recovery centers touch nearly every corner of Vermont. In 2020, despite the pandemic, we serve nearly 124,000 visitors who utilized our services. We grew, we adapted, and we reached out farther and deeper into our communities to serve more people in more ways than ever. As the chair of the Vermont Association of Recovery Center Directors, I've gotten to see up close and personal how the recovery centers and our recovery partners united to face the pandemic together how they became the caretakers and lifesavers for some of the state's most vulnerable people through initiatives like harm reduction to go packs and hotel recovery coaching and street outreach. Beyond the nature of our work as dedicated peer professionals and the low barriers to access, to access all we offer, perhaps the greatest asset of recovery centers is our ability to do anything we set our minds to within our funding. I have seen what we have been able to do with very little, and there's no telling what we could do with more. Recovery centers are home to numerous programs and services that seek to help people at any stage of their lives and in their recovery journeys. With support groups and recovery coaching, the recovery coaches in the emergency department program and moms in recovery support program, 
with health and wellness programs and arts and music therapies, with services in prisons and on the streets, and above all through human connection, recovery centers stand at the nexus of prevention, treatment, recovery, and intervention. Because of recovery centers, the innumerable ways in which recovery can be experienced and can be successful are not limited by how many days of, in, of care insurance companies will pay for or what types of treatments they are willing to pay for. We are not limited by waiting lists or prerequisites. There are no eligibility requirements to walk through our doors, and no one may be coerced into utilizing what we have to offer. We serve everyone and anyone regardless of their background. Quite simply, we do what it takes to save and improve lives every day of the year and around the clock. Perhaps most remarkable of all, our programs and services are provided free of charge. But the most important argument for the value and effectiveness of recovery centers isn't merely an economic one. I'm here to tell you that there are no relationships, no bridges to authentic connection, no catalyst for trust and understanding, no acts of acceptance and non-judgment so strong and enduring as what exists when a peer works with a peer, as when a person who has lived through addiction, mental illness, poverty, domestic or sexual violence, incarceration, or some other aspect of the human condition connects with another and says implicitly or explicitly, I'm with you, I understand, I'm going to help you get through this, and I will not give up on you. There are no forms of hope and more powerful than the example of someone who has been there and lived to help show the way for another. When I think of recovery centers and other recovery organizations in Vermont, I think about the fact that the staff, recovery coaches, volunteers, group facilitators, sponsors, and other helpers who make what we do possible are the living, breathing embodiment of the promise of recovery and the potential that resides within every person. Every person who survives and thrives in their recovery and chooses to give back is all the proof that we need that every life matters and that every life is worth saving. The loss of even one life is a loss for us all. Every person who has received, achieved recovery is a bright light in the darkest of places. They are the proof that recovery is possible, that a life lived in recovery can be beautiful, healthy, happy, and fulfilling. By choosing to work in this field or, or help others in whatever way they can, every one of us tries to helps to provide the understanding, the compassion, the healing, and a way forward and through the darkness that we all seek. No matter who we are and what we've endured, all of us are healing from something and all of us need hope in our lives. That's what recovery centers are about. Not only do recovery centers serve the most people of any node in the addiction related continuum of care in the state of Vermont, but we do it with remarkable effectiveness and without significant resources in a way only peers can or would. It is because of this organizational DNA, peer run, cost free and holistic that we've become a, a beacon of hope. One that I hope will light the torches of others. Where there's life, there is hope. And when there is life and hope, there can be recovery. I'll conclude by saying this, one time is funding, one time funding, like what is available via the CARES Act, is sometimes portrayed as a bad thing, as unsustainable. But what it is is seed money for growth, capacity, and innovation in a time of unprecedented need and demand. Our recovery services are in need of both the unprecedented investments possible through COVID-related funds, but also sustained funding from state and federal sources. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity here and now to invest not just in recovery from the pandemic, but in our recovery oriented system of care. Beyond COVID funds, one opportunity would be allocating the $1.5 million settlement from McKinsey, the, the McKinsey op opioid settlement, and perhaps future opioid settlements to the recovery centers. If we were to each to receive a portion of this settlement, it would be a game changer for our capacity to make a difference. The Attorney General and recovery centers fervently back this use of these funds, which would not affect the state's budget and bottom line directly. If you'd like to hear it, I could share how I think this would help transform our centers. Through the legislature, we have from time to time received state dollars, including $13,750 for each center in 2018 and $20,000 $20, in 2019. But these dollars are neither predictable or codified in statute. I hope someday that will change. Meanwhile, the state of Vermont, the Department of Health, spends 11 times as much in federal dollars on treatment uh, as on recovery services, 
33 million dollars to three million dollars even though we serve many times the number of people as the treatment system at a fraction of the cost and in a more sustained and holistic way outside of any state dollars we um, and finally i hope that the legislature will prioritize legislation such as the recovery residence bill this session as timely and bold action is greatly needed. If I can just add one, one quick thing, Daniel, that was, thank you, Daniel. Um, you know, Daniel mentioned the one-time money that we received. Basically, the, we, the recovery centers have been level funded for six years, five years or six years, I'd need to double check. And uh, the one-time money is always welcome, but if we can build that base, it's gonna be very important over the long haul. So, questions? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll be getting, right now we're sort of in the middle of thinking about federal dollars that have uh, come to us since December. And then we've got another uh, un, unknown amount of money that will be coming to us uh, soon, we hope. And then we also have the budget consideration. So it's within the budget that we'll be looking at base funding, which is always problematic. Uh, you know, there are so many of our really important uh, community service agencies that remain level funded over time. So it's, um, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to remember it for, um, We'll try to remember it for uh, the budget process. So I know that there are questions. I've got three questions to start it off and then um, we'll move on to uh, Senator Hardy and Senator uh, Hooker. So um, I don't know which one to ask first. The, the first one I'm gonna ask is a little strange perhaps for you. But I was in a, a meeting with some folks, some constituents, and there was a conversation about women leaving the Chittenden County Correctional Center who had been only in the Correctional Center because of um, overdose or substance use disorder issues in the community. And that they are being left out at the um, bus terminal, or Cherry Street bus terminal. Now, I don't know if you know about this group of people uh, or, or what relationship you have with them in the recovery center, if any. Well, I'll let you speak to the recovery center, Daniel, but I would just uh, point out that at VAMHAR, we have developed uh, an organization called the Vermont Alliance of Recovery Residences, which is, a, which is an affiliate of the National Alliance and we are working very hard to create more housing for people in recovery. There are nowhere near enough beds. We all know that. So Daniel, you go ahead. So Senator Lyons, I'll, I'll uh, respond to your question actually in two capacities. So uh, what I'll say is this, um, the relationship bet between the recovery centers uh, and the Department of Corrections uh, has been um, pretty distant for a long time, but I do see the Department of Corrections making a bigger effort to connect with all forms of aftercare, including recovery residences and recovery centers. And in fact, recently a representative from the Department of Corrections reached out um, and is gonna be coming to our uh, Association of Recovery Center director meeting at some point here. Um, I, I do see a, a sea change in their um, approach, um, but as you said, it's, it's been pretty uh, difficult for a long time. So I see some movement and, uh, and I know that uh, Annie um, from the Department of Corrections has been at our intervention treatment and recovery uh, subcommittee meetings and has been a real asset. So I think there's something happening you may, in my capacity with here locally with Jenna's Promise, um, we opened the Ray of Hope Recovery Residence for uh, women who are uh, who have experienced human trafficking and uh, other complex traumas. Um, one of the things that we have long ignored is the fact that about 75% of all women who are in the correctional system are people who have, are our survivors of domestic or sexual violence. 
and, uh, and, and end up there um, often because of uh, drug related crimes or prostitution or other, other things. So there's, we've sort of uh, ignored, I think the traumas and the underlying root causes and, it's, and we've left people vulnerable after they get out of prisons. So it is absolutely essential in my opinion that the Department of Corrections take that extra time, just like the treatment centers are mandated to do, to reach out personally and say, hey, we've got this person. Can you connect with them at the recovery center? Can you connect with them before that out of the recovery center, out of the, out of the correctional system? Help bridge back into the community, provide a sort of ad adapted version of, of COSAs. Um, the, uh, a key example, and I'm not qualified to really talk about this at length, is the Rutland Turning Point Centers program and the correctional facilities, which we would like to adapt for the other facilities around the state. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, but I really appreciate your question. Right, so uh, what would be extremely helpful is, uh, first of all, to thank you for your uh, very excellent testimony and maybe we could get a copy of that if you yes. send it along to Nellie and we can post it. But Will then, do. The other, the other thing, and you don't need to respond to this right now, but it would be extremely helpful to know from your perspective what uh, we can do uh, on our side of the fence to help uh, with policy that moves DOC and recovery centers and others uh, in the right direction. So you're talking about it now, but if you have the wrong people in, the, in those positions, then uh, those initiatives just can disappear. So uh, your, your comments on that, in addition to your testimony, would be helpful. My client, uh, my, I, I have one last question because I want to let others ask a question. So I'm going I'm to limit <laughs> what we're doing. I, I apologize, but we're, we're moving closer to our joint session this morning uh, with the House. Um, so my last question is, can you also get to me ASAP the immediate needs that you're seeing within the recovery center that might well lend themselves to um, federal dollars that we currently have? So we have money that's come to us uh, in December, and you obviously have, uh, I understand the significant increase in need in your in your bailiwick so please send me as quickly as you can um and you can copy the entire committee there's not a problem with that but uh, i'd like to see it so i can i'm thinking about putting a letter together to the appropriations committee that would allow for us to um help folks who have seen a drastic increase during covid thank you so much Okay, well, you know, there you go. It's an open door at this point. Yes. Um, Senator Hardy and then Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, uh, and Daniel, thank you so much for your testimony. It was really helpful. I, you, you said that there is a network of the, I, I'm, I'm just not as familiar with the, the, the sort of system and how it works or your structure, I guess. Mm -hmm. You're all independent nonprofit organizations in throughout the communities are, are are you located around the state i know of the one here in my county but yeah um, if you could just speak a little bit about that structure and i just want to echo what the chair said about getting us specific language and requests that we could use um in our capacity here but if you could speak to your structure that'd be great Yes. So each of the 12 centers, which cover the 14 counties, we have, uh, we are independent 501c3s. We work uh, very much with VAMHAR, uh, Recovery Vermont, and we are uh, a, a part of the Vermont Recovery Network, which is its own 501c3, which helps to coordinate the recovery centers. And then uh, we formed the Vermont Association of Recovery Center Directors, uh, literally like practically right after the pandemic came on and we had to quickly adjust our operations uh, amidst the, you know, the governor's orders. Um, and so that's a new creation uh, as of March of last year um, that really seeks to unify our 
our approaches and our methods. So it's it's not like uh, incorporated anything, but it is a way for us to be united in a, in another capacity. Um, so that's. And are your centers um, residential or or there or are they a mix? They're they're not re well. <laughs> this is an interesting question. So we're non-residential treatment. We don't do treatment per se in the way that the the that it's defined where it's sort of there's a real separation between recovery and treatment that is sort of like the fee for service model. Um, so in terms of residential, some of the recovery centers have recovery residences, which are not treatment facilities. They're um, really the only treatment facilities are uh, Valley Vista, Brattleboro Retreat, and Serenity House. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh... I'm president of the board of the Second Wind Foundation in White River, and it's an example of yeah. one center that also has, it has a transitional house for women now, and we're about to open one for men. But I don't know how many of the centers do that. It's probably, how many do you think, Daniel? There's probably four of us now that have recovery residences. Um, certainly, Springfield uh, and my and ours, um, and and uh, I think there might be one more. Um, and one one important thing to note, um, Senator Senator Hardy, is that uh, one of the innovations that we've taken because of the you know the the, it, the rurality is is really a, a huge issue in our state. Like even like Morrisville, my, uh, the territory that I cover goes from Eastern Chittenden into the kingdom and, and down into Washington County. So it's like we have counties, but it's also we draw people from surrounding areas. And I say that because an example is like Upper Valley, that there's a couple of centers, including mine, that are building uh, or getting satellite facilities to deliver services in remote counties. And I think that that's one area that is essential for our future is not only shoring up the facilities that we have, but also uh, reaching out deeper into our communities and through collaborations to deliver services, both virtually and in person that we've never been able to do before. Okay, thank you. And Senator Hooker has a final question. And Just then we're to, thank get you. To Just a up. quick one, and thank you, Daniel. Um, your testimony was very impressive, and I'm glad you'll be sending us copies because I'll need to look at it to get all the facts. But um, you did mention 124,000 visitors yeah. that you've helped. Are these unique um, interactions? Are so we, uh, so we, um, it's hard for us to do, to uh, to measure unique visitors. Um, because we have both our, our core services during staffed hours, and then there will be meetings at night after staffed hours and other things. Um, but that's, uh, you know, like my center, for example, um, we served uh, 8,031 visitors, uh, unique visitors in 2019. We're, uh, and we believe, and like all of those would visit many more times, you know, they, they might come repeatedly over and over again. So we, it's hard to track uh, unique visitors, but we do the best we can, but we know that we miss some of them. Okay. And just quickly, the, your um, peer coaches that go into the ERs, they're volunteers. Right. They they are now they aren't now. Um, we do have a program through the it's uh, through, through the state opioid response grant from SAMHSA um, through the Division of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs, part of VDH. Um, so it is a funded program now. It's not at all of the recovery centers, but it is now at I believe nine. Pete, is that right, Peter? Nine of them. Um, yep. so nine of us have that program um, and uh, and deliver it at our regional hospitals. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, right, thank you. Um, uh, just, uh, I had the opportunity to attend a recovery program that was put on by the Seven Days newspaper folks. Um, and now I've, I've lost historically where it was, but it was pre-COVID, just, just pre-COVID. And the, the one of the big things I pulled out of that meeting was the number of years it takes for recovery to happen and the number of times people relapse into their um, 
clinical problems. So uh, we understand that, you know, the visits you're talking about may or may not be new folks, but certainly important to keep people moving in the right direction. So. All right, well, we have accomplished a great deal this morning, uh, folks. Uh, we're, we're going to end our committee meeting at this time and we are going to a joint assembly with the House for the election of the Sergeant at Arms and others. I was very curious what it was. Um, okay. and, and I just want to thank you for taking this much time for us. And it's really good to see you all. So be well, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Thank you so much. You, uh, you as well. Stay well. Thank you. Yep. All right. So committee, we're good. Um, I have a bunch of things to talk about. We will do that tomorrow because um, we're not coming back together today. But 